Hello fellow time travellers, uh, welcome to the next episode of my Love Letter to the British Isles podcast. Uh, hopefully together, I certainly do, but hopefully you will join me on what I regard as an unforgettable journey through time and also space, because as well as the years, we, we cover a lot of ground. Uh, it, it, the story starts for me around a million years ago in the British Isles with a set of wet, soft footprints in mud on the Norfolk coast. And then gradually through the course of the podcast, we get closer and closer to the present day. Uh, and it's the, the stories stop off at sometimes uh, expected destinations, you know, Stonehenge or Westminster Abbey or places that everyone thinks about and knows about. Other times less familiar. Uh, but at all times we're walking in the footsteps of the ancestors, trying to imagine what made them tick uh, and considering uh, the effect that the activities of the ancestors have had on the way we live today. I like to think it's got everything in it from, from the earliest hunters through the first farmers in the Stone Age, the usual suspects, kings and queens, uh, the brutality and the battles that they provoked, sometimes moments of, of individual bravery, many occasions of genius, inspiration, but all the time, blood, sweat and tears. It's, it's a million years worth of story. Um, and I, I like to think that it, it, it touches upon all the things that I care about and all the things that move me. So to help support the making of the podcast, The Love Letter to the British Isles, uh, please sign up to my Patreon site, uh, where there's more uh, films about how history and the present day run alongside each other, you know, separated by a thin gossamer curtain, but they sometimes feel so close together, past and present. So there's history, there's current affairs, and there's my comments for what they're worth on both. Uh, I put up a new vodcast every week, um, a film here in my home in Stirling. Uh, we've by now got quite an archive, there's quite a collection of, of videos on all sorts of different subjects. It's quite, a, it's quite an eclectic mix of, of topics that we run over. Sometimes we do competitions, Paul and I. So join me at patreon.com, search for me by name, Neil Oliver. I'd love your support. Uh, and in, in any event, I'd like your company along for the ride. But in the meantime, it's time to step off on the next journey, the next part of the journey in the love letter to the British Isles. Let's cue the music. Our modern world, to some extent, it's a veneer. It's scraped thin like butter over toast. You know, it covers the surface, but it doesn't go very deep. And if you, if you go that bit deeper, then the distant past of our species is still here. In these British Isles, you can time travel, not just in terms of centuries, but in terms of millennia, and be reminded that it was all very different once. And after some centuries and some millennia, it will all be very different again. The next podcast in this series is a walk down one of the oldest streets on the planet. Ancient meals eaten 40,000 years ago. The story of weapons, survival and creation. A time of woolly rhinos, spotted hyenas, lions and hippopotami. Artworks of immense beauty. Mysterious symbols carved into rock. Artists leaving their marks upon the face of time with the oldest art ever discovered in the British Isles. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last episode, we were in Wales at the oldest ceremonial grave of a Homo sapien ever discovered in Britain and Northwest Europe. Where are we this week? The third place on my journey is somewhere that, whenever I visit, 
well, it touches my soul. Hidden away on the Derbyshire-Nottinghamshire border, the astonishing Cresswell Crags. You can stand in one of these caves in Cresswell Crags and you are inhabiting the space and breathing air in a location that was known to our species tens of thousands of years ago. And it's, it's an extraordinary sensation to have. You know there were people in those caves. What strikes you about it first and foremost is it's a very beautiful, peaceful little spot. It's a, it's a quite a shallow gorge, so there's cliffs of limestone either side and they're separated by a stretch of water. There's like a, a shallow lake or, or lagoon there. Eroded into the cliff walls on either side are caves. You cannot help, as you walk alongside them, get the impression of Cresswell Crags being like a row of Stone Age houses because you've got one cave after another, quite close beside one another, uh, all different shapes, obviously, because they're just natural features, but it's so easy to imagine more than one of them being inhabited at the same time by different members of a community of hunters. So there's this sense of it being like a kind of uh, Stone Age Coronation Street or Stone Age East Enders. You can imagine people uh, being familiar with who lived either side of them. Now, to some extent, you might be bringing that with you in your own imagination, but there are, there are several caves at Cresswell Crags, and it's perfectly reasonable to imagine that more than one of them was being used by different families or tribes of hunters all at the same time. It's very striking. You get a sense of kind of community atmosphere from it. That's such a wonderful image. A street much like our own, but from 40,000 years ago. Yes, uh, it's, I suppose it's indicative of the fact that um, human beings of one sort or another, Homo sapiens, which is us, or Homo neanderthal, which is another sort of human being that we also know used those caves, uh, they have certain behaviours that we can identify with and, and recognise right away that it would make sense for people who are, imagine that they were being occupied probably in times when the climate was difficult, let's say, maybe cl close to an ice age. People's lives were difficult and in those circumstances it would certainly help to know that there were several of you, you know, as many people as possible upon wh whom you could rely and cooperate with when it came to hunting and finding food and making fire and all the rest of it. So it makes sense if, if the hunters were coming through the landscape for the first time and they happened upon this gorge, thought there's a good place to take shelter anyway, down beside these cliff walls. And then better yet, they find out that there are caves, quite substantial caves into which they could go, go uh, make fires, shelter, sleep, uh, take back any food that they had collected, share it, cook it, consume it. Uh, it would make sense. It's a, it's a natural feature in the landscape that would lend itself to a population of hunters who need certain things, places to shelter, places to sleep, places to share their food. I know it's putting a modern sensibility on it, but when you take a step back and put yourself there, you naturally imagine them helping each other. I always find it enormously comforting to know that while across a huge expanse of time and history, and we're talking here about tens of thousands of years ago, during which time climate has changed and been different at different times, people's circumstances have been unimaginably different. You know, people with none of the infrastructure and, and modern civilization that we take for granted. But nonetheless, they were still people like us with the same brains, the same emotions, the same needs, uh, the same problem-solving abilities. And there's something very reassuring in knowing that even when the world was very, very different, there were certain things that were still constant. And that would be people realising that at certain times it was good to cooperate. That rather than being one people, one person on your own, or just a couple with your babies, that it was going to be a lot easier and that there were more opportunities to be successful and to thrive if you could cooperate with more like yourselves. And so you can easily see why people would fall back on the idea of the family and then from that the clan or the tribe. And you get, and it's not civilization, it's not even necessarily what you could call society, but it's people realizing that they're all in it together and that if they cooperate, 
their combined chances of survival are increased. How many different occupants have lived on this street? These caves have been used again and again and again. You know, they were used in the modern era. You know, they've got names like uh, Robin Hood's Cave. You know, so modern people, people from, a, from the last few hundred years, were, were already using them again. So these caves have an enormously long history of habitation and of being put to use by human beings. At the time we're talking about here, uh, when the first hunters of our species, Homo sapiens, were using these caves, we're talking about perhaps 12, 13, 14,000 years ago. Now, we know from geology that that was the time when the, the last ice age was in retreat. The climate was, it was up and down. It didn't consistently get warmer. You know, there'd be, there'd be a period of, of decades or centuries when it got warmer, then it might dip into cold again. But broadly speaking, the, the ice age was over and the temperatures were mostly improving. But it was still a challenging, a very challenging environment. 13,000 years ago, those hunters were living and, and operating within a few miles of the sheets of ice. Ice, a third, half a mile thick, wow. was still in their world. And they were on the edge of it. And so the land, it, the, it would have been colder than we are used to a very challenging environment. And one of the prime objectives would have been to find shelter. You would have needed uh, to rely on the fact that you could get in somewhere, in out of the wind, in out of the snow, and somewhere that it was going to be easier to build a fire, keep a fire going. Somewhere that the the hunters could uh, leave their, their women folk and their babies and young children behind in a safe location while they went out to maybe hunt a, a base. You know, people need a base. They need somewhere to come back to, somewhere that they can all operate from and know that, you know, as it's getting dark again at the end of the day, they will all congregate back at the cave and you can then go on with the rest of life, cooking, eating food, looking after children. How do you survive here when there are no shops, there are no modern clothes? And basically, you're a naked ape in a very cold climate. What can you make of this world around you to protect you and enable you to function? And then you think, these were clever people. Then inevitably, you're thinking, these people must have been able to make clothes. They must have been using animal skins, but not to throw on rough. They must have been making, they must have they'd be using bone needles that they made from the bones of animals, and they would have been using threads that they made from uh, the ligaments of animals and from other materials, and they would have been cutting animal skins expertly and shaping them to fit their bodies so that they ended up with garments that were fit for purpose, that kept them warm, that kept them as protected as they could be from the environment. And you get a sense that in order to survive in, that, in those circumstances, you had to be sophisticated and clever and imaginative and skillful. Otherwise, the, that, that environment and the animals that are in it are going to make mincemeat of you, literally. But the Homo sapiens, you were there from around 12, 13,000 years ago, they're not the first inhabitants of this street, are they? No, what makes the Cresswell Crags even more fascinating, even more human, uh, is that there's evidence that 40 to 50,000 years ago, long before the last ice age, the species Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthal people, also made use of those caves. And we know that because they left behind stone tools, hand axes, and evidence of uh, the creatures, that, the animals that they had been hunting or scavenging and making use of. Uh, and that's uh, evidence of the uh, further evidence of the idea that we share certain things in common, not just with each other, but even with the earlier versions of humankind, including the Neanderthals. There's a long line. I mean, everyone will have seen in one version or another an image that is usually called the Ascent of Man, uh, and it's it's an image that has uh, a lineup of of human beings uh, from uh, with a, a tall smooth, clean-shaven hunter at the front carrying a spear. And then behind him, uh, there's someone who, who's also quite upright but looks a bit more primitive. And then it goes so on back down the line until bringing up the rear is a knuckle-dragging <laughs> ape. 
<laughs> and, and the implication is pretty clear that you're left to, to assume that we are the best. We are at the front of the queue, that evolution finally got it right <laughs> with Homo sapiens, and that everyone behind us is a little bit more lumpen, a little bit more animal. Okay, so it's quite a, it's a very um, cocksure, uh, audacious statement to make, really, because as we learn more about the earlier versions of humankind, frankly, the, the paleontologists are discovering all the time that they, they shared a lot with us. They were different. They were, they were different versions of humankind, but they shared a lot of the same concerns and they operated in similar ways, coming together as families and as tribes, working cooperatively. Uh, so in addition to Homo sapiens, which is us, and the Neanderthals, which uh, were another version of humankind, paleontologists working around the world have found evidence of much earlier creatures. Four million years ago, there was an upright ape called Australopithecus, the southern ape. Four million years ago, there was a creature that was walking on two legs uh, and, and beginning to operate in a way that we would recognise. You've got Homo habilis, which is the handyman, Homo ergaster, the working man, Homo antecessor, the pioneer man. You've got all these versions of humankind that paleontologists have found enigmatic, ephemeral traces of. And what we're also having to realise, which is even more incredible, uh, is, the, is the certainty that we shared planet Earth for a certain period of time with other versions of humankind. Everyone in Europe, everyone in the, in the Northern Hemisphere has within their DNA traces of the DNA of Homo neanderthalensis, which is absolute proof positive that at some point our species was meeting and mating with, breeding with, Neanderthals. And there was a hybrid product of that. There were, there were children sometimes born to those couplings which also survived. So at Cresswell Crags, we see that 40, 50,000 years ago, there were Neanderthals in those caves. And then much more recently, after the last ice age, our own species was there. And it, but it's not to say that there isn't the possibility uh, that there was a coming together of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. In the street? In Europe, <laughs> not in that street. There's no evidence, there's no evidence of that, but it's not, it's not impossible because we know that there were Neanderthals alive in Europe as recently as 25 to 30,000 years ago. Now, the remains of the Red Laddie of Paviland that we've talked about elsewhere in this podcast, he was alive in around 34, 33,000 years ago. So there's every possibility. We know that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals were sharing Europe and parts of Asia at certain times. So we've got much more in common with the rest of humanity than perhaps we would, allow, we would have allowed for even a hundred years ago. How long has this evolutionary process been going on? During the last several million years, there have been multiple experiments, you might say, by Mother Nature with what it is to be an ape that walks upright on two legs and uses arms and hands for making tools and that came together and worked cooperatively in family units, in tribes, in clans. You're talking millions of years. Our species, Homo sapiens, is only around 200,000 years old. So we come in very recently in the story and Mother Nature has been trying one experiment after another and for all we know, there have been periods in the past when several of those species shared the planet that were all alive and walking about on two legs at the same time, maybe sometimes getting on all right, rubbing along together as, as neighbours and, and fellow <laughs> creatures. Maybe other times there was trouble. What we do know, without a shadow of a doubt, is that we are the only ones left, you know, by you know, 20,000 years ago, let's say, whatever had been the circumstances of the other kinds of humankind, they were all extinct. And for the last 20,000 years, we have been alone on planet Earth. We are the last of the humans. One of the things that we, we think we know, we're, we're 
quite confident of about our species is that we're quite good at breeding. It's possible, it's possible that, say, the Neanderthals, uh, the Neanderthal species, they might not have been as numerous as us. And so we know that the uh, Homo Neanderthal was in Europe and in parts of the Middle East lo and you know, long before us. You know, they had the place to themselves. They were maybe on the move from 300, 400,000 years ago. Then, you know, 150, 100,000 years ago, our numbers start to nudge into their territory. Uh, and we don't really know what happened next. We know that there was some breeding because we, we have some Neanderthal DNA in our DNA. Not much, maybe three, four percent, but enough to show that at some point in the past, our species interbred with Neanderthals. And we know for a fact that there are no other species of humankind left. The Neanderthals are gone. The, the, all the other homo whatevers are all gone. <laughs> now, was that just because we were more successful, had more children, were more prolific, and gradually pushed the other to, to, to the edges and finally into extinction? Or did we behave as our species has often done? Were we aggressive and violent towards... And did we have the force of numbers that, that, that gave us the upper hand? And that was there anything, you know, violent in that story? We don't know. We possibly never will. But the fact is, now, today, there is only one species of human being on the planet, and it's Homo sapiens. So because of the bones that have been found here, we know that 40,000 years ago, next door to what is now a modern village with its corner shops and pubs, there were woolly rhinoceroses, spotted hyenas, lions and hippopotamuses. All those creatures, versions of them. So, so 40, 50,000 years ago, you've got um, that uh, limestone gorge with the caves is, is there. It will have been there for a long time by that point, And Neanderthals were in the habit of making use of it. They wouldn't have, in all likelihood, they didn't live there full time. They would have come and gone, you know, at different times. They'd have been following the herds of whatever animals, and from time to time, they would have been able, in their seasonal round, they would have made use of Cresswell crags. And yes, hunting those creatures that you mentioned. Around 25 to 30,000 years ago, the, the last ice age set in. The climate dropped, uh, snow fell didn't melt, was gradually impacted into ice, and over a period of hundreds and then thousands of years, great walls of ice developed in the high country and then pushed down into the, into the lower land, sculpting the landscape as they went. It lasted for thousands upon thousands of years, and it pushed out all of life from our part of the world, from these islands that we know as the British Isles. The, the climate became too difficult, and the animals withdrew, the human beings withdrew, probably down towards the Mediterranean area where the, where the climate was a bit kinder. Then by about maybe 15,000 years ago, the climate began to improve again. The ice began to melt and recede, and the climate improved to the point where the hunters, who by this time were us, modern Homo sapiens, began to walk back into the area. Very important to remember that at that time, we weren't a set of islands. We were still a peninsula of northwest Europe. And the animals moved back into the north and the hunters came in behind them. So their movement was dictated by the movement of the animals. That's by about 15,000 years ago. And so uh, Homo sapiens, hunters of our species, in their own turn, found the caves at Cresswell Crags and made use of them in the same way that Neanderthals had done tens of thousands of years before. They were just the latest tenants of that accommodation and would have used it in the same way. They probably didn't, they wouldn't have stayed there 12 months of the year or for years at a time. It, it, much more likely that at different times of the year that the, the movement of the animals would have put them in that vicinity, they would have used the caves and then at other times they were elsewhere. And how do we know that they were there? Well, there's uh, finds of uh, artefacts left behind. We don't have we don't have any um, human burials, for example. We don't have, say, a red lady of, of Paviland in Cresswell Crags. But what we do have are things made by human beings, things that human beings have left behind. In 1876, someone went into uh, one of the caves, which is known to us as Robin Hood's Cave. 
it's got a connection in that part of the world, the Nottinghamshire Derbyshire border. It's got, you know, it's people have connected it to the story of Robin Hood. Someone went into the cave uh, uh, called Robin Hood's cave and found a piece of horse rib bone, just a, a tiny little piece, three, four inches long. The sort of thing you would just, you might look down at and mistake for a bit of broken twig, a bit of broken tree branch. Picked it up and looked at it and realised that there was uh, an engraving on the flat surface of the rib bone. And it's an engraving of a horse, or really it's a, a horse's head with the uh, eyes flaring, uh, the mouth a little bit open as though it's galloping, uh, the mane the, the hairs of its mane are kind of swept back as though it's running at full gallop. You can see a little bit of its body and a suggestion of its forelegs. It's a very, very clever piece of art it, made by somebody who really knew how to convey the sense uh, of a horse. Someone who had hunted the horse, someone who knew how a horse moved, understood it intimately and had the artistic ability with just a, really just a few lines etched in with a with a, a sharp point suggested most eloquently and most effectively what it is to be a horse. So this was found in 1876. Quite soon after it was found, people were uh, were dismissing it as a fake. People thought, no, it's just a it's just something that's been that's been concocted by somebody in the modern era. It's not real. But more recently and to the present day, we accept it as a piece of art that was created perhaps 13,000 years ago wow. by, by one of those modern human beings, Homo sapiens, that was making use of the caves at Cresswell Crags. Wow. Now, we already knew by the time it was... This, people were already aware uh, that uh, hunters elsewhere in Europe had created works of art. Yeah. There are cave systems in France and in Spain that are famous for those... You'll have seen yeah. the, the images from Lascaux in France and from Altamira in yeah, Spain. Amazing. Whole torrents of animals, uh, uh, bison, lions, bears, deer, all sorts of creatures evoked in the most extraordinary fashion. Yeah. They are Sistine chapels of art. Extraordinary. And it, it was thought for a long time that this far north in the British Isles that life was just too hard 15,000 years ago, that people would have been so preoccupied with just staying alive, just hunting for some food, gathering some some uh, some wild foods, uh, keeping people warm, keeping people on the move, that that would have been enough and that there would have been no time for something like creating works of art. So suddenly by 1876, you've got this piece of uh, horse rib and the assumption was that, yes, it had been created long ago by someone with an artistic talent, but it had probably been carried. Someone had had it in their pocket They'd come from much further south and that during one of their stays in Cresswell Crags it had kind of dropped out and landed on the floor and stayed there. People just didn't think that there would have been that kind of behaviour going on in our part of the world at that time. But much more recently, in the last couple of decades, specialists in cave art began paying proper attention to the cave walls at Cresswell Crags and they found in uh, some of the caves... Uh, artworks on the walls. Now, they're not painted. When you go to Lascaux and to Altamira, the, the artists were using uh, natural pigments and they were and they were painting on the walls and, quite, and they've survived very obvious. Some of them look as fresh as though they were made yesterday. The artists were operating differently in Cresswell Crags and they were etching, scratching lines into the rock. But they were working very cleverly you know, they were using the, con the natural contours of the rock to suggest, in some cases, the musculature of a mighty creature like a bison bull or the, or the athleticism of a deer. They're, they're, they're exploiting the natural contours. So, so once again, it's evidence of people with real artistic ability coupled with very intimate understanding of wild animals. Hunters depend to a great extent upon being able to catch and kill wild animals. They need them for food, for clothes, the bones and horn, for making tools and all the rest of it. Their lives are entwined with these creatures. And it, it would appear that, as well as being an artistic expression, uh, it's been interpreted that, that these artworks were being made by people who needed to at least feel that they had some kind of influence over 
the animals. Maybe they were going into some of these caves and there in the dark, lighting torches, lighting fires and, and making art as part of ceremonies and rituals which they hoped would maybe bring the herds closer to them. Maybe they would give them some kind of power and influence over the animals. So it might not just have been about artistic expression, it might have been that, but also expressing the need and the, and, the, uh, and the connection that they felt to these animals. Remember, tens of thousands of years ago, uh, without our science and without our modern understanding, hunters and their families, they might not have seen themselves as being separate from the animals. You know, big creatures like horses, deer, mammoth, they may have felt that these were equally important members of the world community. And they wouldn't have thought of themselves as being superior to them. So it would be more like brother bear, sister lion. And people are, 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 their lives and their destinies are intertwined with these creatures. And so the, the desire to make art and to, and, to, and to sense a feeling of communion with these creatures upon whom their lives depended might have been, might have been profoundly important for them. So it's not casual artwork. Now, the artworks that are in... Uh, at Cresswell Crags, they're, they're very hard to see. They're very faint. Uh, they, they may, maybe in the past, they were filled in with pigment, which has since been you know, eroded and worn away. Or, or perhaps they were always intended to be quite slight, something that the spirits of the animals or, or the gods would see. And they might just have been making the, the most ephemeral suggestions of these creatures. There is nothing quite like it because when you, when you get your eye in and you suddenly... You remember those 3D uh, posters that were all the rage for a while, you know, that you had to sort of look at and cross your eyes and if you did it just right, you suddenly the image jumped out at you, a, le a leaping dolphin or a, or a, or a fast-moving car. It's like that. You, you look at the wall and if you're lucky, all of a sudden it leaps forward, this bison just suddenly steps out of the background and you're looking at it and you see it. And furthermore, you can see the way in which a natural bulge in the rock, that the artist has looked at that bulge and felt the suggestion of, of a powerful animal. And you know that line about, they talk about sculptors freeing a shape from a, an uncarved block, yeah. that they look at a block of marble and they see the image and it's their job to free it using their chisels and their hammers. Yeah. Well, there's some sense of that, that, that someone with an imagination was looking at the, a blank wall of rock and felt almost as if they could see a bison and using their artistic skill, they make it rise, like an angler uses a fly on the water to make the fish rise. And so someone used their imagination to make the bison rise to the surface of the rock. And you can experience all of that and you think, that happened, that moment of creation was... 13, 14, 15,000 years ago and you can feel it happening in front of your eyes. It's powerful magic, really. And they are just heart-stoppingly fascinating because they suggest people who, even in these very difficult circumstances, living on the edge of the ice age, living in a difficult climate, fighting for their own survival, still they were thinking big thoughts and expressing those big thoughts about their fellow creatures and the relationship that they felt with them. To stand in the shadow of them is really quite something. And is it true that there are abstract designs made by these ancient cave dwellers that we still haven't managed to interpret? Yes, there are, as well as being uh, depictions of animals, uh, there are other uh, marks in the rock which are man-made or human-made uh, which don't obviously declare what they are. And uh, arguably, most fascinating of all, some of them have been made in the, in the deepest, darkest recesses of the cave. Places into which you would have had to crawl on your tummy, maybe holding a little uh, torch of, of animal fat, and get yourself into a claustrophobic location, and there make these you know, little artworks. And then once you withdrew, who's going to see them? It's not going to be other hunters, is it? It's not going to be the members of your tribe. And so we're left to imagine that maybe some of the, the artworks were being made for the consideration of whatever lives in the dark, invisibly. Spirits, ghosts, uh, the, the ancestors, or, or even gods. Who knows 
for whose consumption some of these artworks were actually being created. And yet again, it's yet more evidence of even in circumstances so hard and so different from our own, you're reminded that they're just people like us. Amongst other things, amongst getting on with the day-to-day, their minds drift to thinking, what's it all about? (laughs) Is this all there is? You know, what's the meaning of it all? For as long as there's been human beings, there have been some among them who have reached out into the dark and thought and asked, what is this? What is it to be alive? What does it mean? Why are we here? And those questions seem to find their expression in these artworks on the walls of a place like Cresswell Crags and the Derbyshire Nottinghamshire border. They're just... It's what is also also heartbreaking in a sense. You know, if you take that little horse rib with the depiction of a horse upon it, 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 it's someone of great ability. It's an artist. Imagine if all we had of Michelangelo was a little sketch on a piece of crumpled paper that someone had found in a bin. Imagine if that was all we had, that everything else had been destroyed. So in the case of the artist who made that little horse rib, you know, where is his Sistine Chapel? Where is his David or her David? What else did they make that we have not had the opportunity to share? So that artist from 12,000 years ago has managed to leave their mark on the world. That's so extraordinarily touching. Yes, and it, I, that's another. You bring up a, a, a perfect point that we all of us, at moments in our lives, either deliberately leave things behind. You know, people sometimes make up a time capsule. You know, they, they've got a plastic box and they put in some photographs and mementos and they bury it in the garden, hoping that someone will find it in the future. Or people keep a diary in the sure and certain hope that someone in the future will read those thoughts. You know, and sometimes we just accidentally you might have a, a, a pen knife or a piece of jewellery and it falls from your neck or falls out of your pocket and it, it, you know, it goes in amongst the bushes and gets, and gets quietly buried, only, put it, only to be discovered at some point in an uncertain future. And that would be the proof, that might be the only physical proof in 10,000 years' time that you ever walked upon the earth. But a desire to leave something behind is profoundly human. You know, to reach out into the future, to reach out towards the future so that you can say, I was here. I was here for 50 years or 70 years, but I was here. And please know that. Lots of people feel that and try to leave something behind. Well, there at Cresswell Crags, maybe you've got somebody thinking like that, thinking, well, after I am gone, this engraving I've made on the wall or this piece of art I've left behind will at least be proof of my life. It's so humanising. You can so easily, by these tiny traces, have a sense of communion with people who lived unbelievably different lives in an unbelievably different Britain 15,000 years ago. But you can reach out and sense, yes, I, I understand what you're trying to do here because you are a human being and so am I. Rising from the depths rose force and power unimaginable. Travelling at hundreds of miles per hour, it ripped across the North Sea towards what was then an outcrop of Europe. Such was its power and devastation that this great wave, this tsunami, has gone down in history as the greatest natural disaster the world has seen in the last 8,000 years. From among the wreckage and havoc it caused, the foundations of a nation were laid, the British Isles. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these isles of ours. Go to the website to see the places I've chosen and let me know the locations that inspire you. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music by Malcolm Goldie. Additional research by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, Teddy and Archie. Finance, Catherine and Trudy. Post-production, Althorpe Studios. Photography by Neil R. 
Graphics, Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. An FBF Podcasts production.